This is Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast. Did you guys see this? This is unbelievable. What is that all about, Kinger? Get in here for the real thing. Like, let's get weird. Maybe I blacked out trying to figure out what was going on. Doubt, worry, fear, because that's what we're breaking the mold on here. Welcome to Wild on 7th, presented by Pilot Games. We're here until it's here. And welcome back to Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast presented by Pilot Games. Don't forget, if you're out and about enjoying a libation at one of your local establishments, use their products, e-tabs, because when you do, your community wins. Uh, Kinger, speaking of winning, uh, I think you just got back from Las Vegas, and you're looking pretty bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Now, I know we are recording on Wednesday this week, not Monday, but all things considered, you look good after a weekend in Vegas. Yeah, I had a good time. Uh, We were early, early start, early to bed. Um, We had a hotel that was not a casino, one of these Marriott places. So you could kind of leave Vegas at night, go home. Uh, Our son was there. We could play some cards, wind the day down. You know, it was nice. Yeah, it was. So you kind of subscribe to the theory of, what is it, uh, healthy, wealthy, and wise? What does that saying go? I don't actually know. Is that, does that mean go to bed early? Yeah, exactly. I really don't enjoy staying up late. I would rather day drink, um, you know, step into one and then come home and maybe eat and, you know, go to bed early. So what was the highlight of the trip? Uh, we saw U2 at the Sphere, um, which is an out-of-body experience. I, it would take more longer than this podcast to explain what they're doing in that giant ball of screens. Um, so that was definitely number one. But you came back looking a little bit like uh, the hair was greased back. Like you got yeah. a new look. Like Vegas what? is Vegas is my town. Is it, it is your. I feel comfortable there. I'm not the only guy in a pinky ring. Um, we got a bleacher seat at Caesars for the football. Sat up. I mean, this is a rare occasion when you can say to your wife, "Honey, uh, for the football, we're going to buy four ninety dollar bleacher seats." Uh, it's the right thing to do. You don't want to be just wandering around no place to go, trying to see over people's heads. And then you're in there, you got a, like a, your own seat, a wristband, waitress comes, you're forced to sit and watch football and drink or it's bad ROI on the investment you just made. Right. And you can leave, you could go, you know, she would go on a walk for a while. That Viking game was pretty tough. Yeah. So she would be like getting her steps during that game. But yeah, I, it was great. A couple nice dinners and uh, in and out pretty quick, though, Friday to Monday. It hit me. Early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. That was That's you in Vegas. That's a cool phrase. That was you in Vegas. I've never heard that, and I really like that. Yeah, maybe <laughs> never, I will get it. You've tattoo. never heard that? No. Oh, man. no. Uh, so how did the bets go? Did you play I did bets? well. I did well. Uh, I can take a win. So the problem people have in Vegas is they chase it. So if I go to a roulette table with 100 bucks and I'm up to 200 I'm going to the pay window. I I just took money from Las Vegas. I reached into Las Vegas' wallet and I pulled a hundred bucks out. You know how rare that is? So I just if I get a win, I take it, even if it's a small one, singles and doubles. Um, hit on the Vikings because I bet the money line, not the points. Um, Did you hit the under? hit on the hit on the wild? Uh, I hit on uh, the wild tw- twice, maybe. Uh, they only won the one game, but I did well. Yeah, I uh, I brought cash, went to the bank beforehand, had enough cash to pay the dog sitter when I got home. Uh, <laughs> I scored at Beer League last night, threw 100 bucks on the bar, and it, I never went to the ATM, and neither did my son. So that was uh, – it was great. It was absolutely great. Thanks for asking. Yeah. So let's talk about – because you're just taking the world over right now. It's planes, trains, and automobiles. You had – was it your live TV debut – well, certainly like that, yeah. And I didn't realize everybody was, you know, you're going to, you know, John's going on TV, you know. My, 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 <laughs> so hold on, we got to set this it, up. So this before, is. Before we get into this, we got a great guest today, John Hines. Yeah, uh, the first that's time gonna, a coach. That's going to be, yeah, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be a fun one. We'll get to him in about 10, 15 minutes. But we, it was the. And listen to us talk Van, about ourselves until. It was the, it was the Vancouver game. Uh, nine o'clock start. John comes into the studio. I'm doing pre and post game on Bally. So we're in the studio and John comes in to join us for the show. So tell us about your experience, John. So everybody was, it was creating a stir. You know, you're going to be on TV. I'm getting texts from people. Uh, my wife is, my wife does this thing. She says, uh, um, 
you know, are you going to get a haircut before you do the TV thing? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, should I get, okay, so you're getting a haircut. I got it scheduled for tomorrow. Um, what are you wearing? You know, you're not going on there without me seeing what you're wearing. And uh, so it was almost like I had clothes laid out on the floor, like a fifth grader or a second grader, um, you know, uh, showered, shaved. Um, and uh, but I so the live TV thing, man, I had no idea. So this is a shout out to Audra Martin. OK, I walk in there. There's no teleprompter. It's live, which is terrifying. There's a thing in your ear telling you 10, 9, boldy clip, boldy on ice, handshake, Zuccarello, 2, 1. And then she just explodes into whatever the content is for five minutes at a time. Obviously, you do your thing too, but she's, I think, writing a lot of that structure and you're coming in there. And I, I just, I took it for granted how... It just looks like television. So when you watch it, you're like, oh, there's those two people kind of shouting at me about the wild and it's, you know, Thursday night. And But when you're there and you're in that studio, which is kind of small and all these cameras running in and out, moving chairs in, it was unbelievable. I, I think I, Audra Martin, how she hasn't had a nervous breakdown or, or something, I have no idea. It was, I was so impressed with uh <laughs> So did you have a nervous breakdown? No, because I got – it did make me very nervous because I was watching you guys do all this stuff. And then you also have kind of like a TV voice. You kind of like are like, and welcome back. Uh, we're here with the Wild in the Vancouver. But when you see it on TV, it doesn't look like that. It looks normal because it's TV. But when I was in the room watching, I'm like, oh, no, do I have to like talk different or like sit straighter? Or, but I got it easy because you kind of just threw me on a captain's chair and – talk to me it was basically like this but yeah it psyched me out a little bit beforehand so rate so your props to props to audra you do a wonderful job as well but she might be the hardest working woman in show business rate your performance uh okay maybe a b uh, i should have um jake middleton was behind me on the screen shirt off i should have just done a little you should have got weird yeah a little and get you know kind of get his chest hair that would have been cool um I, I, instead, I just looked at it. I just turned and looked at it for a while while I was on TV. It was my good side. You know, I'm missing a tooth back here, so you guys had me on my good side. But I don't know. I got texts the next day like, you should shave every day. You looked nice. <laughs> so I shaved today again. Maybe it'll change my life. I what did the group chat say about, about your performance? Group chat was a little upset because uh, – rat got so much attention you know are you better friends with rat than us and you know what's it's it's all rat all the time you know another night with john talking about rat yeah so and apparently rat was pretty excited to uh be on there he had sent the note to some people but it was cool thanks for having me i it's it's no it, that is no joke live television man uh i mean i did it humble you, you a little bit? Yeah, because so you, you came in it. hot. The, 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 speaking of group text, you came in a little hot. Like, hey, like this, this isn't my first th this rodeo. This is live yeah. TV. It's not a big deal. Everybody's panicking. Like, I'm getting text messages from all outlets that they're concerned that I'm going to be on TV. Like, it's yeah. fine. I've done this before. It's totally easy. And then you got there in the bright lights, and uh, and we shook hands, and it was a little clammy. And yeah, I, I was I was nervous because I, I had done the – I've been interviewed before on television, but I had never been in what I don't even know what you guys are doing. It's like these five minute <laughs> blocks with clips from the game. Kevin Gorg is someplace. I hear him in my head, but I don't know where he is. It's and then a camp like there would be like I was going to sit in a chair with you and Audra in the second segment. OK, these segments are only five minutes long. There's no chairs in the room. And I'm just sitting there thinking. Somebody should get the chairs going. <laughs> like, we're going to need to be in the chairs in, like, five minutes. It sounds like there's only, like, 90 seconds left. And sure enough, you know, two-minute break. They're doing commercials. Guys come in. They just set the three chairs down. You know, Audra might say something to you. you and then we're just on live television. I, I would just – there's no way I would survive a season without making a huge mistake. I want to ask you a thousand questions. Also, can't be hung over ever, no. apparently. Like, got to look good all the time. 
Oh my God. I think I felt like, like the pressure young women feel with Instagram today is what live television was like for me. Like I couldn't, I love just being on a podcast and talking with you. Like it's so much more chill. Yeah. That was very stressful. I, I did. Fine. How would you rate your, uh, your outfit that day? Picked out. Yeah. Pretty good. You know, a little conservative probably. What I wanted to do was, uh, were you concerned at all that the camera adds 10 pounds? So you wore black to, to like, counteract yeah i definitely i in when in doubt black i i wish i would have worn my tuesday night hockey jersey <laughs> and just been like what's up boys <laughs> I, just, I see you like that's who i want to be cowboy hat because we're doing well in the wild west tuesday night hockey jersey but yeah i kind of i fell into line did you ever think like like the the path that you've been on you i mean now all of a sudden you're breaking down wild video on wild live bally sports like th there you are you're doing it you ever pinch yourself i uh i i don't know i um i all i know is i i wouldn't want to do that that is too hard and you're good it i was, talk i talk too slow to <laughs> be like <laughs> they'd be like 10 9 no i'm it's very cool what you guys do and uh i was very impressed and i for anybody that's ever been hard on audra martin holy crap man you try a day in her shoes and see how you do so let's uh, get to why the people are here, and it's, it's wild hockey. Road trip, I, I was hoping they'd find a way to win three of four. That Vancouver game maybe kind of set the tone, too, because I thought that they were the better team for sure for the first 20 minutes and then just couldn't find a lead and then you know ended up giving that one up. But 500 on the road trip, I think you'll, you'll take that. By all accounts, everybody I've talked to, it was a taxing road trip based on travel. And it's not that the flights were terribly long. It's just that no game was in the same time zone. So they're switching time zones. I think they were gone seven, eight nights, different time zone, three, four, five times. So uh, hard, hard travel. Why did they travel like that? Why would they be like right next to the two cities and then they would go one way and then they would come back? Why yeah, were they doing that? I'm not sure. The The league kind of sets it up that way. Uh, I think that... Yeah, that was odd. Like we're in Edmonton, we might as well do Calgary. Yeah, and... Uh, but the I thought that they played pretty well against Edmonton, but at the same time, Edmonton's just kind of on a heater right now. And, and we should probably do a little look around the league because things are changing all of a sudden. It's like it's like moving day. It's like Saturday at the Masters all of a sudden where th things are starting to change. The Central seems up for grabs. St. Louis just fired Barubi last night, so they've got a new interim coach in there. They're feeling like they've got a shot to make a run at a wild card spot, maybe another one in the central. Uh, and I mean, your take on on some of that stuff, like the, where the wild at with their game? Like, are you comfortable? Uh, I want to see us. I'm, I'm kind of circling this Vancouver game on Saturday. Yeah. I think the the league is a little bit like the NFL right now, where there's a handful of teams that just seem stronger. You know, you think of the New York Rangers. You think of Boston, some of these teams, and I Vancouver is very good. Like when we, when I was watching that game, just the amount of skill players they have, you know, Quinn Hughes on the back end, good goaltending. So I want to see how we do in that game. I want to see us just beat a really good team um, and kind of well, that's kind handily, of handily, like we did against the Rangers here, you know, a month ago. That's kind of what it's been. With Hines behind the bench, it's they've beaten the teams that they should. The one team I think that was good where the Wild went in and kind of just dominated them was Nashville in Nashville. Yep. But aside from that, it was Chicago, St. Louis, who was beatable at home, Nashville, uh, Calgary they beat, uh, Seattle, the two teams that they've lost to, Vancouver and yeah, Edmonton, Edmonton, the two better teams. So now all of a sudden you've got one of those better teams coming into your barn. I think for sure you circled that game on Saturday against Vancouver and say, all right, we'll see what where they're kind of at. They've shown now all under Hines that they can beat the teams that they should beat. Can they beat these teams that maybe on paper might have a little more going for them? That's absolutely right. And, and nasty power play on Vancouver. You know, our defense, we got Brodeen out. Um, there's a, it's a handful. So if you can win that game, and if you can put make a deposit on Thursday against Calgary as well. well they should be Calgary. That's one where you're like, you don't look past okay. this game. Don't look past this game. But you should absolutely beat Calgary. Because then he would be, what, 7-2 and two as a head coach if we won both those? Is that right? Are they 5-2 and two now with him? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great – that's a nice digging out of the hole or whatever uh, yeah. Marcus was saying. But that would be great. 
So more look around the league. Let's talk about Evander Kane and the hit on Jonas Brodeen. And I think there is some consistency, but the Department of Player Safety, I think, has done a pretty good job with some of it. Uh, but did you see, obviously the hit, no penalty called on the hit for Brodeen. Brodeen ends up getting injured. He's going to be out for a while. Um, and then Hartman gets a retaliatory penalty. And then I think Edmonton scores on the power play. Kind of unfortunate circumstances. Uh, but I think everybody was looking at that the next day, noon, wondering if there's going to be some type of call to Evander Kane, and there wasn't. And you look at what's transpired over the last week. It's just madness. Players watch. They must watch. Like, no penalty call in that play. No supplementary discipline. They're like, let's party. Now you see forwards all over, like, crushing the D all over, you know? Uh, and what was it? It was the Buffalo game. Somebody on Buffalo ran somebody. They got a penalty, and then Kyle Ocposo was was – on camera saying it's just inconsistent. You don't know. Like some days it's a penalty, some days it's not. Some days it's you had special, cousins, you had uh, you had Dylan Larkin getting popped. You had I mean it was just all over. It was like yeah the the director of player safety was cousins went, went yeah. out of a town and then they were like let's let's have a party. At their well, house. I think it's more just an illustration that that everybody's watching and if they're watching a play where somebody gets injured, they go out, no penalty, no suspension okay, then that play is legal. And I don't know if guys are out there like being that active in their thought, but at the same time, maybe there's a little more reservation if there is some supplementary discipline. But there wasn't. And now you see Good Branson got hit. Uh, I, I don't remember who the one was in the Buffalo game, but it's three or four instances now. And then the other one that has people throughout the league upset is the stick penalties. So Truba got a fine for a two-handed slash, and then Perron got six games for a cross-check to the jaw. Yeah, that was after the Dylan Larkin. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's – it's, you've talked in the past about this is – we're getting to the point in the season that it's just – it's just hard, right? Like, it's kind of like shake your fist in the air time, right? So I don't know if it was they're seeing that they can get away with stuff or it's just – yeah, man, we've been bouncing off bodies for a while now. Oh, I think you could also illustrate that guys are starting to get tired. I mean, there's tired mistakes being made out there. Yep. And travel's starting to wear guys down. The schedule's starting to wear guys down. And where some of these plays weren't happening as frequently the first 20 games while guys are fresh, now you're starting to see these plays happen a little bit more. And I think you're also starting to see the pressure of standings you know, Perron, in his in that instance, if you didn't see this play, what happens is is Dylan Larkin gets hit, something happens in lights out front of the net, and then he's laying on the ice. Perron night night. circles he's back. He's laying like a dead man on the ice. Yeah. Perron circles back. He looks over his shoulder. He sees Larkin laying there and Zub standing over him. But Zub's body language was one of which, like, hey, blow the whistle. Yeah, this guy's he's, bad. Yeah, there's something going on here. And before he could recover, Perron took five strides, something like that, came over, cross-check right to the jaw, intentional, up high, missed the shoulder, six games. Um, and I think some people didn't like that suspension, um, but that one looked that one looked harsh to me. Did you see it? Yeah, I've, I've heard all that. I've been following all these things getting dissected, and it sounds like, you know, um, they, they say if you look at the two different – angles on the Larkin thing that it looks better from one angle um and Perron just did exactly what you said you turn around your captain's like a chalk outline on the ice and you you just I got to do something you know and if that guy's the closest to the crime scene I'm taking one of theirs and so I think you kind of understand it's it's but it was just madness. I don't know what was in the water. Was it a full moon or like a waxing right. moon? It's been a crazy a, week. A waning moon. Um, but yeah, that was that was something that that what people are saying on the. I was curious on Brodeen that you know he he didn't shoulder check is what I keep hearing. You know he he kind of he didn't he, he wasn't aware that Kane was on the ice or he didn't you know he just missed one. He didn't look over his shoulder like most defensemen will do, and then he really ran into one. What was your take on that? Well, I I so I, I was I'm a four checking forward. And I typically take the side of the four checker. Because yeah, you like to bounce guys off the wall. No, what I say is, like, you should know. 
Like, I know your job is to break this puck out. I know your routes as a four checker. I know where you're going to go with this puck. It's and I'm one coming. way or the other. And your job is to know I'm right there. And I'm going to stop by contact. And I have to go full <laughs> speed. I can't go half speed because you're a good skater and you spin out of it. I lose my job. You know. Yeah, I like I this. So this is the four checker alibi. Yeah, you, you know I have to be there. Okay. So some D will protect the puck in such a way that their number is always exposed. Right. So then you never can hit them. And then you get to a spot where it's like, okay, well, he saw me. He saw me. He showed me his back. That's on him now. Right. Now, if he doesn't shoulder check, so he doesn't see him there. um, I think it's a little bit different, but I still think that there needs to be more responsibility on the D to protect themselves. They don't want to turn the puck over because now that's their job in Jeopardy. That looks bad on them. I understand. Um, I get both sides of it, but I'd like there to be more. The other thing that really stinks about this is the forechecking forward, what he faces is a penalty. What the defense faces is injury. And I think that's what you'd like to somehow take out of the game. How do you change that? And I wish the D would only have to worry about turning the puck over, potentially getting a minus, the other team scoring. But injury all of a sudden factors into it, and you have to protect the player a little bit in that regard. So you're saying there's a split second as a forechecker where if – Brodeen had looked, then he has full permission to to just drive him hard because he, it's almost like if I was on a, in a car and there's someone waiting to come out and if I can see them looking the other direction, yeah, that's the way they're going. I'm gonna I'm gonna like I'm I might not take my uh, put the brake on, but I'm gonna take my foot off the gas to see just to make sure. That I'm not going to run into them blindside. So there's a little like in the code of the game. There's that little moment of like, well, you're also he, forces- he knows I'm coming, so I'm coming full. Or if 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 you were Kane in that situation, Brodine doesn't shoulder check. You would maybe you know hold on to him a little bit different. When he for when you're forechecking, you should be watching all body parts and language. So if he looks over his left shoulder and you know what you got over your left shoulder. And he doesn't look over his right. You likely know he's going over his right shoulder. Pilot so you game. can take that angle. You know, you can take that part. And if he if he slides that way and still shows you his back, he gets hit. That's where I think it's on the D-man sometimes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because no. you're going to turn. If you don't like what you see left, that's the only way you looked. I know you're going right. You know what I mean? It does make – when do we play Edmonton next? That's going to be – I don't like the Oilers. I don't like McDavid. I. He's just not – He's not my superstar. I just – Evander Kane. So that's one I got circled. I'll I'd think, like to make a trip to Herbie's before and after at that one. I don't think I clarified anything answering that question other than just going on a filibuster about what it's like to be a four-checker and the frustration of, of D being smart in that regard. But what I think should happen is four-checkers should four-check with one hand on their stick, and it's stick on the puck, and you almost take away the holding penalty. So you can't call a hold on a on a four check. So if I have my Brodine's a lefty, he was coming around the net from left to right. Mm-hmm. So if I can get my stick around him and then I hug him on the wall, no penalty. Even if he tries to skate out of it, no penalty, because that would be a hold. Because I'm holding him with my free yep. arm, but he's not going to get injured because I can hug him. So he's not going to beat me. He's not going to beat me up the ice. I can potentially turn a puck over, but I don't have to crush somebody, right? What ends up happening is guys say, okay, well, I'm going to go two hands on my stick or I'm going to do something because I'm going to actually physically hit them. You don't have to physically hit. You can bear hug, but they took that away because now guys get so many tripping penalties. Well, and it's a Vander Kane. Yeah. I mean, Which, let's, let's just be honest. Yeah. It's a Vander Kane. But that's, 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 what, I don't, I don't that's probably think, what I would I think do. he would. I would pull, say allow he, four checkers to yeah. hold D. He's pulling out. the wall, on the goal traffic. line to the wall. Let him hold him. Let him hug him. Let him hold him. No penalty on a, on a legit four check. So let's talk about the Brodeen injury. So I remember last year, Eck gets hurt, end of the season. We do a podcast, and we were talking about it. And, you know, we're doing our glass half full. That's what this podcast is. But I could just see in your eyes, like, this is really bad. Like, I don't know how bad it is. And I remember I got off the air with you, and I was like, what do you think? Like, is it going to be okay? And you were kind of like... Might not be okay. <laughs> Eric Sinek does everything. He does this. He does this. He does this. He's on this. He's on this. And uh, is it going to be okay with Brodine out for you know? I think it's going to be hard. I, think you're, period? I mean, you're talking. Who knows? It could be a long time. I think you're treading water, and they 
D pairs were interesting to me. So it was Middleton and Faber. Yep. Spurgeon, Goligoski. Yeah. And then Mermis and Merrill. Bogosian wasn't playing the last game. That Now, that could change, but Bogosian is maybe the only guy that could go somewhere on there. Now, we're, where that is, I'm not sure, but the, the top four might be the top four. So you have Spurgeon and Goligoski. <laughs> Welcome to the NHL, Brock Faber. I mean, my God. It's just going to be like, hey, you feel... What do you think about 30 minutes a night? So I like that top group because they can... They'll be able to break a puck out. They're both movers. Where it might get challenging is if you face a team with like a heavy line or two and it's 60 minutes of those guys battling guys that are 40 pounds heavier. It gets hard. Well, see, case in point, Kane Brodeen. I mean, we saw it against Vegas a couple years ago. He got banged up too. That's the worry, right? And then all the size is on your middle pair. So you have Faber and Middleton. So ideally, at home, you can control your matchup. You get the big guys out against the big lines. That's that's what you want. Uh, but, yeah, it's going to hurt missing Brodeen. we got to weather a storm. It's almost – it's a bit like right now. We can get into the weather, too. Every week that passes that it's not cold as hell and there's not a bunch of snow. Global warming. But it's just – it's great. I'm, I'm like, hey – we just got away with, you know, we're, we're getting away with December. Yeah. Like, the whole thing. Winter's already short. Yeah, we, we like, I know last year was bad. It could still get bad, but, like, as f- we're, we're, we, like, skipped December. And you I think that's what's going to— outside playing pickleball. I know, we could. That's what's going to happen with Brodeen, I think, is every week, every win, every, you know, not having the wheels fall off, you just got to put that in the bank and be like— Okay. Okay. We're still we're still on a heater. It's, no one seems to know that Brodeen's out. You know, I hope so because that was when I when it was him, and he was playing so good. I mean, he was everywhere. He was like basically doing an infomercial, reminding everyone how good Jonas Brodeen is. Yeah, the one man breakout. I mean, he was. He's just a stud. He's kind of like Eck. In the on the defensive side, sort of one of these guys, they don't get the most attention, but when you take them out from an MVP standpoint, they're certainly up there. Let's talk about the weather because, well, it's ODR season. It's outdoor rink season. How is the rink it's, going? It's Do frustrating you, because you want to skate. Like I think for so me, you have not skated yet because it's not cold enough. I don't even have I don't even have water in there. Okay. I don't even have ice. Does your rink have a name? Did I ask you this? It doesn't yet. You should definitely have a name. Yeah. Think about it, okay? Like the Bears Den or, you know, something? Yeah. Rye Rice Playhouse? Yeah, the Honey no, House. don't call it that. Don't call it Rye so Rice Playhouse. The the weather's been great. I don't want to complain about it, but... You're losing time on the rink. You're losing time on the outdoor rink. And so what do you do to, like... Are you, like, repainting the boards or, like, adding a blue line and a red line? Nothing. It's just sitting there. No logo. Grass. I haven't put the liner out. No water yet. It's just waiting. And the membrane. Call one it, thing that we love membrane. to do as a family is get our first skate, you know, or skate Christmas morning, Christmas Eve, kind of. Any shot so at that? No, I, no. Jeez. The weather looks like it's going to be in the 40s still. So if you're, and I know everybody else that has the outdoor ranks or skates on the ponds, there's frustration. Can you imagine being a kid in Minnesota and you're going to have your Christmas break through the new year and there's not going to be any outdoor ice for you to skate on? That's not good. No. It's going to be roller hockey in December. But the one positive there is. This is going to show up in like 10 years in our like national development team. The one positive is, and if you've been a listener of the podcast, the podcast has a theory that Sunbelt states tend to do better later in the season because the grind and rigors of winter wear the northern climates down and they just have a little less gas in the tank. Well, all of a sudden, Minnesota's looking like a pretty warm spot right, right now, and there That's might right. be some more gas in the tank come playoff season. It looks like season. climate is changing the energy around the wild. Yeah. So, so as a mad as I am here. that there's no outdoor rink. Yeah, what if we just have closer. a non-winter? We get an early spring, like one of those like T-shirts, sundresses, 7th, you know, 7th Street, and this might be it. I'm trying to fight the mentality, though, that winter is what it is. It's three, four months long no matter what, and we're just kicking the can down the road. So part of me is wishing, like, let's just get this started so that it ends in March. It doesn't go into April and May kind of thing. No, no, it doesn't slide back. 
that's what I'm hoping. No, better not slide no, back. It's not gonna. That's not how it works. <laughs> we're not gonna have like a winter that goes into July. That I know. Although who knows? Maybe with how weird things are now, I don't know. But yeah, I think the weather is only helping us. Can we talk quickly about the lines before uh, Coach Hines joins us? The uh, so I don't know how long these are gonna be the lines, but Kaprizov Ekboldi. I love this. I think this is great. It seems like they're trying to make Matt Boldy Erickson Eck, and maybe it's working. And I think, I don't know, Kaprizov's still kind of getting going. I like Johansson, Rossi, and Zuki a lot. I think the only switch you need here is you got to flip Hartman between Maroon and Felino because that's just your gangster greaser line. And then you add uh, Freddie with the Deweys. And that levels up that fourth line where they're not even really a fourth line. They can score just as much. So the only thing I talked to Heinz about that. Yeah. You're like, hey, so I was Well, you broke down this. on Wild Live, you broke down his coaching changes and everything else wonderfully. So I think that. I, I mean, think I'm going to. That's the switch. The figure eight there. Yeah. Let's go Goudreau with the Deweys. That's, and I think you need Hartsey. Oh, I swear. So would that make it? Wrong. Would, would it make it. that group gooey? Yeah. Gooey, dewey. Just, I like that. Just gooey. Gooey's good. The gooey line? <laughs> Sponsored by Gushers. I think uh I think Hartman needs to be between Maroon and Felino. They all get their beards going. And that's like the Earp brothers. And then Zuki's having a hell of a year. Rossi's having a hell of a year. Maybe they can heat up Johansson. Eck and Boldy are becoming like Wonder Twins, and that's gonna put pressure on Kaprizov to pop. I think we're really dialing this thing in. Yeah. I'm I'm with you. Zuki hopefully heats up Johansson, kind of like wild construction will heat up your house more efficiently. So if you're struggling uh, with ice dams in the past or any of these winter troubles, condensation around your windows, you're losing heat, and you should probably get that stuff replaced. We're past roofing season, so I don't think that they're going to jump up on top of your roof and replace that all of a sudden overnight, but they – they still can do siding, windows, and help you out with that stuff. So if you have any of these issues, uh, give a, a shout-out, a look to Wild Construction. You can find them at wildconstructionmn.com. They'll come over. They also have storm research tools on their website, so you can check out whether you've been in, in one of those areas that have storm. Uh, it could be part of the reason why your roof is losing heat and you've got issues. could be water coming in. Um, so give these, guys, uh, give these guys a look and uh, check out wildconstructionmn.com. Wow, that you're gonna, terrible. You're gonna throw me a pass. It was it was an abrupt transition. Well, I figured we've been going for about twenty minutes, and we yeah, need the to... first ten minutes was about me and I don't know writing a recommendation letter for Audra Martin, but but you know we're uh, so here's here's how I'll transition into it. Um, sometimes uh, great things are built in Minnesota the same way we're building a great hockey team here, and there's a little family down in Stewartville, Minnesota, Ryan. They started a company called Jimmy Salad Dressings and Dips. You've heard me talk about the coleslaw. But I was talking to my folks last night. I came back from Vegas. Dad wanted to know how the U2 show was. They were going to go out there in February. And he said, you know, we're just sitting here. Got one of my televisions fixed, and we've just been eating a lot of Jimmy's. We got all the dips going with the chips, maybe some of those ruffle chips, put them in the Jimmy's dips, and they really love the salad dressings as well. Interesting fact about Jimmy salad dressings, typically in the refrigerated area, they're like more hockey. You know, they keep them in the refrigerated area, and then you already know about the coleslaw. So check out Jimmy's family-run Minnesota company. Don't you be messing with my dressing. Gosh. Yeah, that was better than yours. It was better. That's all right. Though. I'd seen you, what, you I've have, seen what you do on TV. You're probably fatigued. I mean, this is easy for you. I had no idea. I, I like the lines all of a sudden. And I think Heinz talked. So let's t touch on the top line, Kaprizov, Ek, and Boldy. Yeah, I want to talk about these guys. Uh, you, you have something to say first, though. Go ahead. Well, I think it's Heinz mentioned that he thought the top line was a little stagnant, and that was over the course of a couple of games. So it was Rossi, Kaprizov, and Zuccarello. So he wanted to switch things up. And really all he did is he moved Kaprizov with Eck and Boldy and Johansson with Rossi and Zuki. And I, I, in theory, I, I like it. And Zuccarello, good playmaker, 
I mean, Johansson hasn't been scoring, but he has the ability. So now all of a sudden, can he be the guy that tries to find open ice? And can you get him thinking that way out there? It'd be great to get that production out of him a little bit. So we'll see if something isn't sparked there. I also like Rossi. Whenever you put a young guy with a couple of veterans, they just seem to be the pace car. So, I, I mean, I like that move, too. Uh, but the exciting one is Kaprizov, Boldy, Erickson, Eck, because now you've kind of loaded up your top group, right? Should we call that line the wallet? <laughs> <laughs> Cha-ching. There's a lot of money in that one. Yeah, I. Uh, so I, I have a theory. I don't think Matt Boldy ever was slumping all year. I really don't. The guy missed, what, seven games or something? And so maybe he didn't score goals right away, but he was still chipping in assists. I. You know, give the guy a second to get going. I, I actually think he's kind of been fine. Um, Kaprizov, I, I, I'm so intrigued by Kaprizov this year because there's this, if you're using these Russian parallels, um, you got this kind of Panarin level, and then you got this Tarasenko level. And Tarasenko was up here for a few seasons as well. But there's, I think, I'm, I just want to see him fight through whatever he's fighting through. And really, like, let's get the race car, let's get some F1 stuff happening here. Let's get some separation. Let's see the, you know, the 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 biggest, the NHL store guy. Because, you know, it's been a little while now, um, and he may be dealing with some stuff, I don't know, but I that's the one I'm, I, I'm still kind of waiting. You know, because you had Boldy come back. You know, you've X been this steady presence. Obviously, Rossi did this year what people thought he was going to do a couple years ago. Zuki having a career year, being fed by Kirill, I might add, on a lot of that. But, yeah, I want to see 97 pop here. What are you seeing in his game? Well, I think if you're, if you're trying to figure it out, over the course of the first 30-ish games, he's been up and down. We've seen spurts of what is vintage – Kirill, and then we've seen spurts of what's a, a, a normally a really good hockey player, but it's almost pedestrian Kirill. You know, like there, he has more. Where is it? The problem is that you don't know which direction he's going. So it, there's the promise, like you see in the St. Louis game, and then Nashville, like, the, like it was trending up, and then now maybe back down, and then when's it coming back up? There hasn't been like the consistency. Usually with Kirill, it's there's magic moments nightly, if not every other night. And there were some things that were always constant. It's a certain battle level. It's drawing penalties. It's um, making plays. And even those things are inconsistent right now. So whatever he's battling, whether it be physical or not, I think it's affecting him mentally to where the game just isn't consistent. And right now I think what you're trying is just to find something that consistently gets Kaprizov to be Kaprizov at his best. Well, when I got here today, right, the, the, they're finishing practice. The only three people left on the ice are Zuki, Boldy, and Kirill, and they're just passing to each other, taking one-timers. I mean, they're basically rink rats. And so it's odd that I mean, he's truly a rink rat. He loves hockey. And um, so I just, it's, you know, maybe he's just holding the stick a little tight. I don't know. That's the one I, I feel like. I don't I, know if he's, I mean, I don't think he's holding the stick tight. I don't think he feels that kind of pressure where it's, I need to produce more, grip it tight. Um, I, I don't think that that's it at all. It's just, he's not, he's not feeling great. I don't know if he's not feeling confident. He has, he has the ability to make no look passes and put them on the tape. And in the St. Louis game, Chicago maybe, some of the other games, you could see him start to draw people to himself after winning board battles and taking pucks to the net. Because this is a this is this is a career shift. You get in the offensive zone, you win a board battle, you pull the puck off the yellow dasher, you bring it to the middle, you beat somebody one on one, you know where the pressure's coming from because that defender needs help. You move it to an area where you're the only one that can see where the teammate is. You put it on their tape somehow, and a play is developed, and somebody gets a shot off of it, if not uh, a pass to somebody else backdoor. That's that's vintage Kirill. 
He's, oh, I'm familiar. He's not doing a lot of that stuff right now. He was for a little bit, St. Louis game. Now, is he winning the board battles? I still think he's playing with pace, and that's what Coach Hines keeps talking about. It's just something isn't there, and uh, I, I think you can see it with him playing with the puck. Sometimes it's the play without the puck that is an indictment. With him, it's the play with the puck. It's, it's, he's missing it a little bit. Do we have a uh, Mason Shaw status? Do we know? Has he skated or anything down in Iowa? No, but I had a weird moment the other day. I want Mason Shaw back. I was going to watch video pre-scout, um, and I wanted to watch the Edmonton game, so I go to NHL.com, and I click on the Edmonton game to watch. Yeah. And Mason Shaw was out there. And I was like, what did I miss? He's <laughs> he's back. He's playing. Yeah. He, I'm searching Twitter, the internet. Were you on the wrong article. year? Yeah. There was last year's game against Edmonton somehow, and it just auto-populated to the top of NHL.com. That would have been great games. if you're just on Bally's. Like, well, I tell you what. This Mason Shaw um, tonight, I mean, coming back, <laughs> three <laughs> ACL. <laughs> uh, sorry, Ryan, uh, what are you referring to? No, I want him back. I, uh, I've i been kind of, you know, we've got this cap situation. You said at the start of the year we can't get hurt, basically. We need a, a bunch of guys to play 80 games. We've had a lot of injuries already, <laughs> a yeah. lot. And the best guys, like the guys who can't get hurt are all getting hurt. Yeah. And – so it's almost like you're taking a can of paint and you don't have enough paint to do the whole room and you're just trying to stretch it, you know, like you're putting, you're like stretching the, the recipe. Like I'm going to put a little more water in it and, and try to just to get there. Right. And so I'm, I, I hope that they can kind of, um, you know, pull this together and, and, and keep stringing it together. Cause I, these injuries have just been a blow. So when, when I think of Shaw, I think of anything that can give us a shot in the arm, right? If you can get, like, Matt Boldy's on a heater, you know, the storyline for the next 10 days is that Matt Boldy's slump is over. Oh, Kirill's being Kirill. That buys us a week to 10 days. Oh, Brock Faber's, you know, becoming one of the best defensemen in the league. Oh, we got Marco Rossi, second in goalie scoring. Anything to just leapfrog down the road towards a playoff berth. And I even think – like a guy like Shaw coming back somehow this year, insert him in the lineup, it would be outstanding. Just a shot in the arm. Just something. And it, you used to get that from the kids, right? So you'd get like Sammy Walker would pop up, pop up Vinny Letary. It feels like the Iowa, the I-35 road has been up and down so much with all those guys that you don't get that sort of uh, Beckman pop. Um was that his name? Yeah, Adam Beckman. But like, like I don't know what else you can put in there to just keep us, you know, riding, you know, past the – there's a gas station here. We're not going to stop at it. We'll get to the next one in 50 miles. I mean, well, that's kind of what I feel like. There were headaches with the salary cap, but Brodeen being out, maybe he'll go on IR, and then that will free up some money for them to be able to call anybody up, and maybe that changes who they decide to uh, – to put into the lineup. But I think you're right. It's going to be the guys that are out there now having to somehow provide a spark. And who that is might have to be different on any given night. But one thing remains, it's that you need your studs to be studs no matter what. So Kaprizov, Boldy, Erickson, Eck, and then now Spurgeon. And maybe Goss are going to have to be great. And Goss has been great. You know, I mean, considering the start, I mean, he... You know, if you look at um, – he's strung together a decent amount of games, and maybe it's the system. It seems like when the Wild are playing their best, there's not a lot of pucks getting to the net. But I don't feel that goaltending is an issue for us at all. No. The, Gus is getting better. I think the team defense is getting better. They still continue to play with pace. Hines at practice today talked about how they're doing something a little bit different with their uh, defensive rush against, sword outs. Uh, so they're still tweaking some stuff to make things easier on the goaltender. and uh, But, yeah, Gus coming off a shutout, y- you can tell. He's starting to look better, feel better. Uh, but the West and the Central, we, we already touched on a little bit. It's up for grabs. St. Louis, Winnipeg just lost to San Jose. You know, Nashville, they won six in a row. That got them into a comfy spot. But they're they're not, like, they're not running away with anything. Um Arizona continues to be some pesky little club that wins games. But the Wild, they're not out of it. And that's why like it's this stretch here seems 
extremely important uh, without Brodine because they're not out of it. Like if you're in the West and in the Central, like the wild card playoff race right now, up for grabs. The drive to 85. Yeah, and again, that's why I think the Blues went out and fired Barubi because I think the Blues kind of thought this year would be somewhat of a rebuild on the fly year for them. But now they're like, hey, you're saying there's a chance. Anything could happen. And they did win the Cup in 2019, and at one point during that year, they were, I think, last in the standings, and they climbed their way all the way back. So management's not going to throw in the towel. They've learned from their own experience that you can't give up on any given season. And they're right there. And maybe they feel that they've got the pieces, but that's every team in the Central right now. So if you can string a couple of games together, survive your 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 lows, then, you know, who knows? Maybe the uh, global warming. Yeah, if it over. can stay warm, you know. Stay warm. Let's stay warm. Hey, I got a one analyst question before we get to Heinz. So being a Minnesotan, non-player fan, I've heard people compare Brock Faber to Kale McCarr. Uh, in the last month to Quinn Hughes last night after beer league. Um, and I, even me, I'm kind of like, okay, let's just pump the brakes for a second here. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how good he's playing. I see stuff on Twitter, you know, not a bad night, advanced analytics without Brodeen. Um, he's certainly playing different than he did in college. How how good is this kid? I, his game sets up to be – Good in the NHL, I think. So he's got something going for him. That's a right-handed shot defenseman. Any reliable right-handed shot defenseman seems like they play forever. Yep. You, you just look around. They play forever. So they're extremely valuable. Now you get a right-shot D-man that can score and play offensively. Can skate. Yeah, now all of a sudden you have something extremely valuable. You know, that's, that's Matt Dumba for a long time. Right-handed shot, big shot from the point can help you produce offensively, gives your team something it didn't have before. And Brock Faber might be able to do that. So you combine that with his ability to play defense, um, his skating, his age, his maturity, and all of a sudden you have a package that seems really exciting. You know, I, I don't know that he's going to be, let's walk the blue line like Quinn Hughes or no, Kale McCarr. I agree. I, so it's not it's not going to look like that. But it might be more valuable Yeah. in the end. 40-point guy that is a stud defensive yeah. league and the kind of captain material. Right. Yeah. And I think if you're the Wild, and this is what they're doing right now, encourage that guy to play – offensive situations you know they want to let them go out there and try things on the power play you see something jump up in the rush go for it now they're willing to take a couple minuses there are some defensemen same with forwards where they'll say you cannot make that play this guy can make that play you cannot make that play you have different rules you have different rules i don't think that they're saying rock you have different brock or brock you have different rules than anybody else you can make all these plays you have the leash You've got the equity, go play, and you. I think you have to take that. And he's mentality been doing and that approach when a guy hasn't played in the minors. You're almost doing the player a disservice if he doesn't go to the minors, but you pigeonhole him into a certain kind of game. And I think that's where it's a great mentality that they're encouraging him to foster this offense, to go play, to develop that, because without those games in the minors. The, it just won't come naturally, you know and what I mean? And he's playing completely different than he did in college. So the whole thing's just sort of mind-boggling. Like, as someone that's watched him, it'd be like if, you know, you're watching your your kid play and they're, they got a, the, you know what they are, and then they go into something twice as difficult and they're trying five more things. Well, for any of the, any kids that listen to this podcast, it's you should look at what Brock Faber is doing and learn something from it. He was on a good hockey team that had guys that maybe filled a certain role better than he did. And he was the captain of that team, and he was willing to say, hey, this isn't all about me or how I can play. So His job on that team was to not get scored on right. ever. And he did it to the best of his abilities. Now he comes to the NHL, what seems like it should be a harder task, but mentally he was prepared to do more, I think. Yeah. And to accept a different role and to challenge himself. And he's not allowing somebody else to pigeonhole him into a role that says, you're a number six, number five shutdown D-man. 
he's he's got the fortitude to take a little bit of risk to put it in his game, and he's being rewarded for it. They're like, hey, kid, yeah, you're 23. You can skate super well. Yeah, try that. And that's I, the thing. He's 23 years old, so I mean, he's waiting till this age to prove him to everybody else. Like it's actually amazing. You listen to the coaches. Well, he's never played in that spot before. They all know. They've all talked. He's never ran a power. Some of them are a little nervous about putting him out there in that spot. But at the same time, they don't want to do the young man a disservice. And again, no minor league games. You have to try at the NHL level. So it's never too late. It's never too late. But also be a good teammate. If you remember Brock Faber's episode, that's what he said, too. Yeah. Don't be a turd. Yeah. No, that's great. So we, should we bring in the, the big boss man? I say with this podcast, this is a filibuster start to this. So let's get the final word from our sponsors on the podcast. We'll throw it to John Hines, and, and then we'll peace out with his interview. Concerned about the quality of your water? Unveiling an exclusive offer from Aquarius Home Services, your ultimate solution to water concerns. Elevate your home with a remarkable 25% discount on the state-of-the-art whole home Connecticut water system. Whether it's city or well, Connecticut effortlessly banishes your water worries, transforming cleaning into a breeze and extending the lifespan of your appliances. Experience spotless dishes, softer clothes, and pure water at your fingertips. Don't miss out on this life-enhancing opportunity to enjoy the benefits of pristine water, all with an irresistible 25% off. Dive into a world of cleaner, purer living with Aquarius Home Services today. Aquarius believes in earning the right to be recommended. They're just a click away at AquariusHomeServices.com. How much can you save when you shop Cub? Let's just say you might need a bigger cart. Frozen foods, pantry items, and dairy. Your family will love it. Guaranteed. Billy guaranteed. Or your money back. Save more on essential every day at Cub today. New partner alert, T-Rex Cookies. While they're making a statement, that statement is cravings are not a weakness. I have a sweet tooth. I love cookies, and these are the ones for me. There are four half-pound frozen cookie pucks in each bag. You throw those bad boys in the oven, they expand to about seven inches in size. That's probably enough to satisfy my sweet tooth. Can't wait. They come in three flavors, monster, chocolate chip, and caramel chocolate chip. You can find them in the frozen dessert section at Cub Food Stores and other select retailers in the Twin Cities. They're a high-quality cookie experience that outsizes the competition. Only use natural ingredients that give you a consistent baking experience at home every time. T-Rex cookies. They're making a statement. Oh, boy, do we have a treat today. You know, we, we've... We've always wanted to have the head coach on the pod, and, and Mr. Hines is stopping by. This interview is sponsored by Duke Cannon. If your hair is a weapon or you wish it well, that's kind of ironic that Hines is the guest and Duke Cannon is the uh... – Well, my hair is not a weapon, I can tell you that. <laughs> so if this is not for people like Coach, but if there's other people out there rocking the flow, doing your business, check out Duke Cannon, hardworking product for hardworking guys. Welcome, Coach. Welcome to Minnesota. Um Thanks for coming in here. It's been uh, – we've been enjoying the last few weeks. I hope you have been too. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. It's been a little bit of a whirlwind, but as you said, I think now two and a half weeks in and just getting a better feel for, you know, I think the team and, you know, the players are one thing because you're around it so much that that's probably the fastest acclimation you get then and the coaches, but just the staff and media and, and kind of how the organizations run. It's been – I feel more and more comfortable every day. How is it – how is it as a coach – so – I mean, I don't want to paint you in the wrong light, but let's say you're you're not working, so you're at home, and then all of a sudden you just get a phone call, and then life changes like instantly. Is that kind of how it works? Yeah, it's it it really does. I mean, it's um, you know, particularly the the in season ones because you you know there's a standing coach, and and they're not things where you're having these conversations for weeks, like in the off season. Like I interviewed for the Ranger job last year, and it was. You know, three, four interviews. It was a two and a half week process, and you're you're processing like, okay, what would it be like to live there? You're yeah. investigating different things. You're talking with your family. You're, and these these are really you know, uh, quick quick turnarounds, and you basically pack a suitcase and leave. And so like like quick. how much time from when you get the first phone call till your bag is packed? Uh, on this one, it was about three hours. <laughs> That's I just, three hours. So crazy. I just picture you like grabbing a whistle and being like, "Honey, I'll be back in three months." Well, you know what was actually nice was we were going right back to Nashville. Yeah. So it was like I yeah. had a couple of days, but it was a little unnerving because you were going back there to play right away. But uh, yeah, I mean, literally, guys, you you 
you get the call, you have some quick conversations, talk to your family. My kids weren't even home from school, basically. They got home at like 3 o'clock, told them, and then I had to be at the airport at 5. That's so, so crazy. And then you just pack as much as you can. And then when you get here, you figure out what you're missing. Is life slowing down all of a sudden? Because it seems like mo it's just a sprint. Like it goes from maybe coast mode in between gigs to you got the job. Now it's just like a sprint. Yeah, very much so. It's, you know, you were, you know, you're out and your your life's at a different pace. You know, you're still paying attention to things and watching the game and, and trying to improve yourself. But it's at your leisure and. You know, some days it's really good, and the other days you might decide to go golfing. And you, know, you try to take advantage of the time so you can spend more time with your family. And when you do get back, eventually you're energized. But then you come right. That's probably been the big adjustment was the adrenaline you feel. I haven't had that feeling in six months. Like when you're when you're out, it's like you know you wake up and you get a, you work out and you do certain things. And and then when you get this job, it's like every day you wake up and you're just at a different intensity level mentally and uh but you love it but it's certainly that's been the adjustment of maintaining that day after day yeah kind of getting back into coaching shape so to speak like, yeah you don't have any training camp yeah, either usually yeah. a training camp like yeah. after the first few days your voice is hoarse and yeah. you're, you're getting used to things we're here you just you plop right right in and you hit the moving train should we warm them up kinger with uh some quick hits rapid fire yeah let me we gotta get to we gotta get to know you a little bit my, all right let me I'll, find it on my phone you find a few Stall i'll go for, for a bit here all right. what was your so the premise here is just answer them quick okay yeah if you don't know you don't know you can just say pass but what was your first real job uh graduate assistant coach first concert so your first real job in life was a graduate assistant coach yeah you didn't you didn't have like a flipping burgers or nothing like that oh oh like oh young young no i was uh i worked at no i i was like a uh i used to drive trucks for like crane booms oh yeah yeah that was for like college job yeah, yeah yeah i didn't really work in high school landscaping was high school uh but it wasn't really a business it was more like you know you mowed your neighbor's, neighbor's lawn. lawns and all that to get spending money but then when i was in college in the summer I worked for a construction firm, and I'd have to, like, put the hard hat on. Yeah, well, you know the, you know the, when you have cranes and things like that, and yeah. the guy's driving the truck that says wide load, and they got the, that was that was me. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so great. All right, you caught up now. Yeah, that yeah. was less rapid fire, more my fault though. So yeah. okay. nickname, Heinze. Okay. First figure. concert, Poison. Oh, outstanding. Weirdest thing. Oh, we we canceled that question. What do you listen to in the car? Uh, country. Pet peeve. Pet peeve. Uh, that's my, I got a lot of pet peeves. Let me think about that one. Pet peeve. Pass for now. Yeah. Green light in any NHL city. Vegas. How about your favorite road arena? Montreal. Hockey jersey you had as a kid. Boston Bruins. Pre-game meal. Uh, soup, salad, and piece of chicken. You got a post-game snack, like popcorn in the coach's room? Pizza. Pizza? <laughs> yeah. What's Pizza your, and a cold beer. What's your go-to drink at the bar? Uh, it can be beer as well. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I'd say go-to would be a uh, old-fashioned. Go-to drink at home? Wine. Perfect weekend. What are you doing? Uh, spending time with the family. Uh, golf. Favorite condiment? Spicy mustard. <laughs> I have to you see, you guys are beauties. <laughs> Jesus. I got a funny Heinz story I got to tell you after this. Um, last thing you binged watched, you know, right the day before you became a head coach again, yeah. when you were just on the couch with the TV tray like me. Suits. Well, yeah. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, got a, I got a Harvey picture on my wall. I love Harvey. He's the best. He never changes. Favorite, you, favorite how, holiday. Okay. Sorry, I stepped on you. Uh, Christmas. Uh how many logins? How many people log into your Netflix account? Uh, five. Five? Well, four. Yeah, five total. Me plus everyone else in my family. <laughs> nice. Nice. Who plays you in the movie? Like, what actor would play you? What actor? In the Heinze docuseries. I would like, um, what's the guy's name in the blacklist? Okay. Okay. I have to look him up. What's anybody? Yeah, producer. I don't know. Um, how many kids do you have and how old are they? I got three girls. Yeah. 18, 17, and 12. 18, 17, and 12. You need to take a note on that, Kinger? That's good. I'm going to start. Next thing that's for a number. He's nervous. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I've been married a long time. Um, so and then what's your golf handicap? Like, are you a stud uh, golfer? I'm not a stud. I'm around 8'5". Uh, okay. When you're on the bench, first of all, I want to know, you know those cards that, 
coaches have. Yeah. You fill those out? Yes. Like with your lineups and everything else? What else is on there aside from like your lines and the other team's lines? Well, you have their lines, your lines, the other team's lines. Then you'll have like uh, power play units. You'll have uh, three on three guys, four on four combos, five on six, six on five. So when you get in those situations, you know what the – we already know what it's going to be, but you need to have them written down in case a guy's an in injury or maybe a guy's not playing well or you want quick substitution. So when you get in those special situations, there's no confusion on the bench or who's going to go. And then how about you – are you a gum guy, cough drop guy? Gum. Gum on the bench? Yeah. What, what brand? Doesn't uh, matter? Or? Doesn't matter as long as – right, right now it's the color of the team, so as long as it's green and spearmint. Really? So you you drink you you chew the the gum that's the color of the team. I try, I try if it works. Yeah, that's great. And do you go? So heavy? Are you superstitious? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Do you you're, do a lot of guy. lot of pieces like where you got a lot of gum, or you do it until the flavor's gone and then reload? I usually bring. I usually have three a period. So usually when the, when it runs out, I, I just get. So it. he's not only a superstitious, he's a routine guy. Yeah. You think? love it. Yeah, he's a hockey guy. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it is right there. Yeah, a, he's a hockey guy. Three a period, nine a game. So you're a you're a dude. That's a, an acronym, dad of only daughters. You got three girls. Is that what it is? That's true. Yeah, that's uh, that's the same camp I'm in. Three daughters. I got eleven, nine, and seven. Um, how how excited were they when you got the new job? They were really excited. You know, it's uh, I think they were excited for me. Uh, and, and the family is. It was nice that I was out, but you know I think they're 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 so supportive of 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 this, and I think it's ex exciting for them too. It's a new team, new city, um, and they're they were jacked. That's so funny because my girls like in the summer when I'm home all the time, they're like, Dad, don't you have to be somewhere? Can't you go someplace? Because I'm around a little bit too much. <laughs> well, I was getting a little bit of that too, yeah. so it was. That's too why many opinions I, on yes. what they're doing throughout yes. the day. Yes, yeah. the outfits. <laughs> Are you really wearing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Where were you living when you got the call? Nashville. Okay, so I want to hear, like, Minnesota perceptions from the 18, 17, 12-year-old, even the wife. Like, like what when you're like, Minnesota, what do they say just about the state in general? And then what did they say about the team? Would they be like, oh, that's Kaprizov's on that team? Or, like, what, what was the incoming Minnesota knowledge from, well, the, from the Heinz clan? The way, that, the, way that we, uh, the way that we let them know I got the job was my wife took a picture of, like, green and white Jordans. Okay. And sent it to them. And said, That's cool. Sent it to them and said, these are the new family colors. Yeah, so then I they, love that. Yeah, so then they came home and they were all, then they figured it out and they were, like, they were really excited for that. They didn't necessarily know, like, a bunch of the guys in the team other than the team is good. They obviously were familiar with Billy. Like, they, they knew him from when we were, when we were going through uh, Wilkes-Barre and things like that. We got to come back to that. Yeah. And then, um, and then Minnesota, well, Minnesota nice really is what it is. My wife was, couldn't have been more excited to, to, to eventually get back here just because she's from this area too. Okay. Just uh, – Yeah, Wisconsin? Yeah. You meet her in Wisconsin? I met her at Wisconsin. At Wisconsin because yeah. when you were coaching? When you were coaching. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Do you buy those shoes yet? You yeah. got the green – girls have them. I don't have them. You tell the you girls, need, you need to this get Christmas we're going to buy you stockings to fit in your new Jordans. <laughs> exactly. What size foot are you? I'm a nine and a half. Let's get them the shoes. We got it. That's a gift from the pot. I got to get them. That's great. That's a cool way to do it too. Like new family colors. I love that. Yeah. Let's let's wind back into your hockey career a little bit. National champ ninety five. So I was at Boston College. So this is all very confusing to me because there's a there's another Heinz at BC. You're at BU. It's all kind of, and you win the whole thing with Drury, right? And yep. uh, in your hometown. Yeah. I mean, what was that like? So I mean, that's as a hockey moment. That's the era with uh, Maine was crazy good. Um, BC was actually really kind of down uh, yeah. when you were there. Um, what was it like winning the NCAA championship in your hometown with the Terriers, BU, the whole deal? Yeah, it was. I mean, I mean it was special. You don't have an op a lot of times you don't have an opportunity to do that, and uh, even BU being so close to home that you know you have a lot of family and friends there, and you know the Civic Center. You kind of grew up watching hockey there. You know, when I was coming up, I was kind of more of a bigger Province College fan than uh, than even BU until you get into the you know where you are actually going to decide to go to school but it was uh it was a, it was something obviously you, you know you never forget and I'm thankful I had the experience to do it and share it with so many people that were close to me. Well that's great. Yeah, it's awesome. But that your teams, I mean, there probably was a race to interview you too because I, your college teammates did you play with Greer too? Yeah. So you have like three or four guys that are general managers of hockey teams from your college squad. <laughs> 
right? Like these guys are <laughs> pretty yeah. successful Greer. college teams. My goodness. Yeah, there was there was a lot of guys that played. I mean, you had Drew, Chris Drury, Mike Greer, you know, Chris Kelleher is a director of player personnel here with Minnesota. Jeff Kelty, director of player personnel in Nashville. Pandolfo does. Pandolfo play. was there. Uh, I, I'm probably leaving a couple guys out. Oh yeah, it was a lot of guys that were have kind Studs. of studs gone through yeah when did you know you wanted to be a coach because like there's a story of like lou lamarillo going to brian burke at at rhode island and saying hey just so you know i don't think your future's in playing so Burke went into like management and did other roles but i think he knew that right away like when did you know that you wanted to be a coach so when i went to bu uh i knew i wanted to coach and teach like eventually when hockey was going to be over i'm like i want to i want to coach and teach i just had great relationships with coaches and I really had a ton of respect for my high school coach, and so I majored in education when I went there. And then as I got through school, I'm like, okay, I'm like I was good enough to play at BU, but I probably wasn't going to be good enough to play in the NHL. I could have put, maybe played minor pro. I got hurt my senior year, uh, and then at that point, like Jack Parker was a great influence. Uh, Mike Boyle, who's a strength coach, like these guys are some of the best in the business. And to be around them, I really was like, okay. I'm not so sure I want to be a teacher and coach. I think I want to coach. And then mm -hmm. I got a great opportunity to be a graduate assistant, then work with those guys, and that kind of propelled my coaching career. And then you went right to Wisconsin Develop as an assistant? Uh, no, I went from BU, a graduate assistant. Then I went to the National Development Program. Six years there. With Jeff Jackson. Then I went with Jeff Jackson and Mike Eves. Then I went to Wisconsin with Mike Eves. Yep. Then I went back to the national program as a head coach for oh, six okay. years. Got it. That's the six years. That's okay. the six. And then I went to Wilkesbury. Who came through the development program when you were the head coach? What what era was that? What guys? Uh, that was like Pat Kane, Eric Johnson, Phil Kessel, James Van Riemsdyk. That must be great just to work with. The Mount Rushmore of yeah. U.S. hockey probably from 2010 to 15, right, probably? Yeah, yeah it was it really even uh, – even like Zach Parisi and Suter and um, uh, Patrick Eves and that whole, uh, Patrick O'Sullivan, uh, that was the first gold yeah, medal. That, that yeah, they beat uh, Fleury. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. Patrick O'Sullivan yeah. beat Fleury. I was yeah. watching that. I was the assistant on that team. But it was kind of that 2002 all the way through that those guys were really, really good players coming through. That was the breakthrough. So Billy calls you. You got any uh, – how's – what – this? you've been around Pittsburgh a long time like Billy. What's your uh, – you have any good Billy stories? What's it like when he calls you on the phone? What does he say? I got a great Billy story. So we were, so he had just got done playing. <clears throat> I was the head coach in Wilkesbury. He was doing player development. Okay. So he's still living in Long Island. So he comes into he comes into uh, Wilkesbury. So we're gonna have like a eight eight thirty coaches meeting. He's late. So he comes barreling in. He's got like four Dunkin' Donuts coffees. So he's late and he stopped at Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. So he comes in, he's got, he's, and he's all jacked. Like, hey, boy, sorry, I'm late. I got the coffees for you. Here we go. So he comes in, and then he barrels in the room, starts talking to all the guys, you know, his personality. So we get on the ice, and uh, we're skating, and we're doing like a three-on-three -three drill down low, like a competitive drill. And uh, I see him out of the corner of my eye. He's hovering, like skates towards me, then he skates back. Then he skates towards me, then he skates back. And he's like, then all of a sudden he beelines to me. So I blow the whistle, they do it again. Billy comes over to me. He's like, hey, coach. He goes, this is a little aggressive for a morning skate. I said, Billy, the game's tomorrow. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so great. That's awesome. Oh, Billy's the best. I thought that I was... got one more. Yeah. So a year later, we're on the bench. So he's still, still doing player development. So I'm like, why don't you come down on the bench during games and you can be around the players and this and that. So he's talking to one of, the, one of, one of our guys, and he's like, hey, listen, in between what's was your role is you got to be a little bit of a – uh, you got to be a disturber out there. So, like, maybe at the end of whistles or whatever, like, stare some guys down and kind of get in the mix or whatever. So, anyways, there's a, there's a scrum, there's a whistle. This kid goes into the pile. Ref calls him for a penalty. So, Billy has just told the player to do it. So, now Billy's all mad. So, he starts getting into it with the ref. So, the refs, they're going back and forth. My other assistant comes down to me. He's like, hey, you might want to break this up. I'm like, I don't think so. I said, he's, he's into it now. It's, it's going to be done. So, anyways, he gets ejected. <laughs> he got booted. <clears throat> yeah, he got booted. And we're in Springfield, Massachusetts. And the bench is, like, really long and thin. Mm -hmm. And he's at one end of the bench. And you have to go to the locker room down here. And he's got a shuffle 
through the whole bench <laughs> coming down through. Classic. Just doing the sidewalk. Just doing the sidewalk. Exactly. Exactly. How proud was he? Money on the board the next night. He then? bought. He, yeah. Well, then we came in the room and he was like, "Oh man, I'm so sorry," and this and that. He's was like, it his oh. first game on the bench? It wasn't his first game. Okay. No, no, no he had been. On. But he bought the guy's dinner, so he made up for it. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So uh, back to your coaching path, what, like, what was your big break? And uh, I want to tie it to getting started coaching early because I think 2016, you're the head coach of New Jersey and the youngest coach in the NHL at that time. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, is some of that because you knew right away when you're done with college that, boom, I'm going into coaching and you kind of started, you got your, you know, your head coaching experience? Because it's, I don't think there's any coach in the NHL that gets the job without having head coach experience before, unless like you're Marty St. Louis or something, you know what I mean? Right. So what was the big break? Well, really I was, I was six years at the national program. And then it was after the 2000, the 09 cup for Pittsburgh. At that point in time, I was young. My fan, I had two girls at that time. Family was really young. And I was thinking, I didn't really want to go to the college route. I I was like, I want to try to move up and get into pro hockey. And the, the, the job opened in Wilkes-Barre, uh, and I, I basically got a three-year contract at USA Hockey, uh, and I interviewed for the Wilkes-Barre job. And Ray Shiro was like, "Well, we're going to sign. We'll sign you, but we're going to give you a one-year contract with a club option." And I took it. I gave up the three years at the national program, took the job at Wilkes-Barre. That really was a that really was a game changer. To I think to take that risk. Yeah, risk reward. Yeah, to go do that. Bet on yourself a little bit, and then my time in in, uh, in Wilkesbury was really good. I mean, we had five years there as a head coach, and playoffs every year. Playoffs every year. We had you know, we had some really good teams, and it's just you know you're around good guys. I mean, you're around Jason Botterill, Billy, Tommy Fitzgerald. You're like I was around really good hockey people that I saw how you worked and saw what you did, and I think that was the that opportunity in Wilkesbury. You know, when Ray eventually went to New Jersey, I think, uh, to your point, sometimes you you don't go directly to the NHL without having NHL experience. Mm-hmm. But I think having guys like Billy or Botterill or Fitzgerald or Mark Recchi along with Ray to say, like, this guy's ready to do it, yeah. that was the break. What's the difference in coaching an American League player to an NHL player? Well, the American League player, you have a little bit more, a little bit more control over, just in the sense that a lot of times your veteran players in the in the American League, they're there, you know, if you sign good guys, they're there to help the young prospects. They realize they may go up and play, uh, but they're really there, I think, in in supportive roles. Where I think in the NHL, you know, you have the the pressure on the players is 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 real, Um, whether it's your top end players or younger guys coming in. That I think your it's your ability. At this level, I think to to prove that you can help them uh, on the ice as a team, individually, and I think you have to communicate way more at this level and understand more what the players are going through. Yeah, for me, the the American League is different because it's you have guys that are still peers. It's almost like college a little bit because they're twenty to twenty four ish years old, yep. and you'll sprinkle in the veteran player to help support those younger guys. But it's a younger league. And then they're also a little hungry is not the right word, but like they have to prove like they have to earn their opportunities and stuff. But then you get to the NHL and all of a sudden you have 40 year old guys, 18 year old guys, Russians, Swedes, Americans, Canadians, Czechs. Like it seems like everything changes at the NHL level. Yeah, uh, it, it does 100 percent. Even the schedule like the American League is the second best league in the world. But even when you go from the American League schedule to the NHL schedule, just coast to coast travel games you know every other night for the most part it is a big adjustment but the the harder part of it is is as you said is the dichotomy of your roster from age to nationality to experience to salary to contract it varies mm-hmm. so widely what uh <clears throat> what were your perceptions of the wild coming in so even if you were just sitting in Nashville watching a lot of NHL network or what have you and then then you get here, and maybe what are some of the things that surprised you or were a little different than you thought from the outside looking in? Well, on the outside looking in, it was uh, you know, a team that's always been very, very competitive. Uh, uh, coaching against them, watching them play, that they're, you know, they can play a hard style of game, and, and uh, they have good pieces to their roster, and, and the team, for the most part, plays like a, like a team. Uh, the, now coming in here and, and 
really getting to know them. One of the things that when you come into a team and it struggles, sometimes it is the on ice. The other part, sometimes it could be the locker room. There could be fractures or clicks or whatever. But coming in here, uh, you realize you realize how how good of character the players are. And what I mean by that is they're they're all approachable guys. They get along. There's not clicks on the team. Um, They're they work hard in practice. Like from a, so when you come in as a coaching thing and you're like, okay, that's really the foundation. If you have that, then you can build everything else. And and to me, that's been the probably the best thing for me that jacks me up every day is the type of players and people that you have a chance to work with here. I feel like every coach has a soft spot for a certain kind of player. Do you have any certain kind of player that that you like or appreciate? You know, some coaches were – tough so they they appreciate the guy that will fight and they understand it and there's no communication on it but there's certain types of players that I think coaches like is there a certain style of player that that you just appreciate I would say maybe not style I just I like I like competitors you know I I just think that to to really be effective in in the in the league as an individual for the most part and you know for your team is that you got to have that competitive nature. And that depends. It could be a, a fourth line guy that kills penalties. It also could be like, to me, like a guy like Kirill, who's a highly, highly talented player, but you watch the way that he competes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it gives him a chance to be a great player. And I think it's really influential. I think that galvanizes a team when, when you have guys that you'll bring energy uh, from their competitive nature. And then I, as far as skill sets, I think it's all, you know, you got to have different ones to make up a, a you know a strong team. So you you arrive in Minnesota, the room's good. Uh, so then you look on the ice and you say, okay, what? It seems like they're playing with a lot of pace of play. Uh, they know where to go uh, when they have it. It's very north south, just from a fan looking. So what did you kind of see on the ice, and what were your initial kind of adjustments that you started to make? Yeah, just. Uh you know, talking with the assistants and talking with the management when you first came in and, and you know, having watched some games, um, it's something to me that uh, I just believe in the league that you have to be able to play fast. And I think just through the experiences, even in my time off, what are the ways you can – how do the fastest teams play? And and uh, so to me, when we, when we came in, I think that, you know, the phrase predictable in your room and un- unpredictable to the opponent – you know, it really matters, I think. And, and one of the things we focused on was I, I, when you look at the team, they, they would forecheck, they could compete, they were in the offensive zone. But to me, a lot of times is when you check the puck back and you get it, particularly in the neutral zone and your defensive zone, what are, what are the automatic plays that we can make? And that's we just implemented some of that structure. And that's, I think, allowed guys to play, you know, sufficient structure, but they can still play – to their instincts, but I also think when you are more predictable, your instincts come out more. Mm-hmm. When you know, when I go back for a puck, I know I go here, here, here. I got to make that read. To me, that's an instinctive play that guys can play quicker. Yeah. And describe your coaching style on the scale of Bobby Knight to Phil Jackson. You know, like a, like yeah. where, like where. Yeah, where you're handing you people a book, or you throw in a chair. Uh, or, I'd probably, or both. I'd throw, you know throw what? In a book. Yeah, you know what? I, I'd probably say somewhere in the middle. You know, I think that there are times where, you know, I think you have to, you, you know, the, the, you have to push. You have to push individual players, and you have to push the team. And I think you got to have enough, you know, I think presence and and uh, have that in you as a coach. But I think most of the time, it's more, it's more Phil Jackson. It's more, I think getting the team to buy into certain things, winning commitment from the players, um, trying to understand them. That's what the league is now. Like, I was probably a harder coach coming up through the ranks than I am now. Mm-hmm. Like, I was – You've had to adapt to that. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Like, coming up, you were more. But each stop at the NHL, for me, has been – as a younger guy, you really see – I'd probably say this is the, the least intense I am. So – and – I feel so much coaching in the NHL more, and you can touch on this, but what is it more? Is it more X's and O and coaching, or is it more psychology, getting to know people and trying to find motivators for those people? 
I would say it's more more motivation and relationships mm -hmm. for those players. Um, you know, what, one of the things I think is when when a, a player or a team is motivated and engaged, usually there's not a lack of discipline, lack of effort. The environment's better because the players are motivated. Usually that takes care of a lot. I think that the X's and O's are are they come. If it's just X's and O's and no relit, I think you need you you need the motivation, the relationships, and the atmosphere to drive everything else. Uh, this is going to be off script a little bit. Graph skates. You're a graph guy. They're so comfortable for coaching. Does, does Graph still make skates? I don't think so. So how do you have the Graph skates? Because they look brand new still. Well, I barely skate. So. <laughs> <laughs> Those are out there for like forty old. minutes and. He just I, watched all seasons of Suits. So he, yeah, I think it's like five. I, I think I got him in. Uh, you do the Mike Madonna where you ordered every pair of CC, you know, <laughs> the old tax. You remember those? And Everyone's then, been all over me about those, but those, really, yeah, the graphs. I, I, you know what? They're they're comfy. I, that's what everybody's ever said. They're yeah, comfortable. I got them in New Jersey, so that's probably what. Yeah, that's five six years ago. Are those the ones that are super hard to break in, but once you do, they're like the greatest? No, that's true. Yeah. Okay. The graph is like the old school, like leather inside. Yeah. They're they're like the heaviest. It's like an UG. Comfortable. An UG skate. It's basically. probably like a lazy boy recliner turned into a skate. Ooh. Leather nice. recliner turned yeah. into Why a skate. Why did they stop making those? That sounds great. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they're a little too heavy. I'm not giving them up. <laughs> and then what whose stick do you use? I feel I feel like every coach goes through like the equipment room and then picks one of the player sticks and then puts their name on it. Do you have your own stick or like you when know, you're packing Nashville three hours, <clears throat> do you grab your own stick or no? So in Nashville, Pete Rogers, the equipment guy, when when you know when I got let go there and he he brought stuff back, I had like twelve sticks that I had and they were all taped up. So oh, when that's I, cool. So I just grabbed them, threw them in the car, and then put them. Oh, up so there. you have Heinz sticks? Yeah, Nashville. I don't know. Yeah, what numbers just, on them fifty seven. <laughs> <laughs> no, just the name. You just got that on. That's a good call, though. Maybe I should put that on the blade. 57 flex. There you go. I should put that on the blade. 57. That is a good idea. So you were in Nashville for a while. You like country music. That's what you listen to in the car. What was your best sort of like, I don't know, maybe you're at a party with Carrie Underwood or like what? Did you get into a weird country music vibe being the head coach in Nashville? Any moments, any stories? Uh, I don't have – well, I, I got to meet Luke Bryant, so he was okay. uh, Dirk Bentley. So those guys are – they're hockey fans. So yep. a lot of times they would come in and, you know, it might be after a game, they'd come down in the locker room. Uh, Dirk Bentley, when we played in the outdoor game there, he, he was going to sing the national anthem. So yep. we had his son in the room. We allowed him to come in and, like, read the lineup. So I got to see those guys and meet them. Uh, I don't have any crazy stories. I mean, we went uh, – you know, CMAs was really good. Yeah. So you get to meet some people there, but it wasn't any like, I didn't get to the partying part of it with them, but they were, they're so accessible to, like Jason Aldean's daughter, like it's weird in Nashville where whether you're an athlete or a coach or a country music star, like you're just out in public and and it's kind of just, no, oh, it's just ho-hum. I yeah. was at my daughter's basketball game and Jason Aldean's like, you know, 20 feet away watching his daughter play and it was just like normal. And what were your favorite spots there? I mean, it's it's got to be so different living there versus bombing into Broadway for a three-day weekend or whatever. Did you have a couple restaurants you love or or bars in Nashville? Yeah, well, Fifth and Broadway, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's right across from Bridgestone Arena, right next to Tootsie's. Yep. There's, it's a brand that there's a new building there. Like, there's some really – Eddie V's is in there, which is a really good restaurant. Um, is that that giant food court thing yeah, where it's just yeah. amazing? It like it looks like an airport. That's yeah. just yeah, that place is cool. And there's a place on the top of it called Fifty Vines. Okay, it's like a, a wine place, but you can get other drinks. But it's in the summer; it's all outdoor. So it's you have the view of Broadway, but it's not necessarily the Broadway. You're kind of out crowd. Yeah. You get, I like you that. See, yeah, the yeah. Sky Club of Broadway. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Did, did you buy yourself any Wranglers or cowboy boots, or maybe when you got the job in Nashville, did your wife send a picture of the girls' cowboy boots? Or? No, that was new on this one. <laughs> okay, but someone did send me like a company sent me like Durango, Durango oh, yeah? cowboy boots. Yeah, nine and a half. They were <laughs> maybe nines in those. They run. Yeah, big. The, they want you moving. Yeah. Good. Yeah, fun. Uh, last question from me. Who, like, who is your coaching idol? Like, who did you look up to? Or, and it, I mean, did you just hit the ground running and carve your own path? Or is there somebody that you followed? You know what? When I, uh, 
I really had a, a, a few people that were that were influential. Like I said, I think like my high school coach was a huge influence on me. Just uh, like I just had so much admiration for him. Other than my dad, he was probably a, a guy that I really, really admired. And that was kind of the coaching and teaching. Then having the opportunity to play for Jack Parker, you know, a legend in college hockey. He was another another guy that when I was playing for him, kind of thinking eventually I'm going to uh, want to coach just to be able to follow him. And then, um, you know, when I get into – when I get into pro hockey, it was, you know, Torch is a big influence on me. Uh, Mike Sullivan's another guy that I talked to quite a bit. So it wasn't like when I was younger, it was all, it was all about idolizing. Yeah. yeah, it was all about playing. Sure. But it was when I got into coaching, I was very, very fortunate to be able to work with really good people at each stage of, of my career. And, and they were really influential on me. And, you know, sometimes guys may not get to work with those types of people. But for me, it was... Yeah, I worked with some of the best of the best, whether it was college hockey, junior hockey, you know, American League to the NHL. It's been great. No, man, I think we're thrilled you came by. Um, you know, the whole premise of this podcast is kind of glass half full, trying to turn Minnesota into Winnesota. And um, you've stepped right in and uh, been a breath of fresh air. Even coming on the pod like this is awesome. So we're rooting for you and keep it up against Calgary and then uh, – and then Vancouver on the weekend. Keep rolling. The Wild West. So we'll thanks do. for being here, buddy. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. This was fun. All right. Peace. Thanks, man.